We continue to code the simulation of the epic turtles vs hare race. We have our truck ready and now we need some runners. As I mentioned in the previous video, everything will be coded as object oriented. So what do we need in terms of the runner classes? Well, we have some common functionality and attributes for each player. Each runner will have a position on the track and each runner will have a truck lane assigned to it, etc. So these are all the properties that can be shared for each runner. Similarly, every runner will be able to move and any of the runners can be a winner. So we can start by creating an abstract class that will contain all methods that all runners can share. And that will save us a lot of coding down the road. So let's create a class. So here is my runner class. And like I said, I'm going to make it abstract. Now, just because I made it abstract doesn't mean that everything in the class needs to be abstract. In fact, variables in the class will not be abstract. They can be used for each runner object individually. I am using an abstract class only because I do not want to allow for runner class to be instantiated into an object. And as you know, abstract classes cannot be instantiated. Obviously, we need to generate random numbers and the numbers will be generating in the class only, so I made it private. Now, all the other are public because these are actual variables each runner needs. Original position is the position from which the runner moves. Current position, over here, is the position where the runner ends up after the move. Runner symbol, over here, is a string that will represent each runner on the racetrack. So for example, turtles can be a capital T and a hair can be a capital H. Name, over here, is the name of the runner. Obviously, the names can be simply turtles or hair, all spelled out, but we could use really any name. We can name the turtles John, for example. Or when we create a new runner, we can give it any name we want. Lane refers to the assigned lane each runner has. For example, Turtles can be running in the lane 1, hair can run in lane 2, etc. Remember, each lane is a column on the track, and once assigned to a runner, it remains constant for him. And finally, move description, over here, will hold a string of the move that we can display on the screen. Remember, we have moves like big hop or small slide, etc. And each of these moves corresponds with the runner moving up or down the track. However, we can display the name of the moves as string on our screen. But there's one more variable we need, which may not be obvious yet, but it will come very handy later. And that is a list of all runners. This is our abstract class from each runner we'll inherit, so each runner will also be of type runner. For example, a hare will be of type hare, which is going to be its separate class, but also of type runner. And turtles will be of type turtles, which is its own class, but also of type runner, because they both inherit from here. This is extremely useful because it allows us to put all the runners into one list, even though each of them will be of a different primary type, such as turtles and hare. And the list should be static, because we only want to use one list for all objects. So here's my list of all runners. Like I said, I made it static. Okay, so this is all the variable that we need. As I mentioned, we will generate the random move in this class and just have the result available for each runner. And for that, we can create a method. So our method getMoveType returns the actual move, which is going to be the integer. Remember, we are moving based on percentages, just like I showed you in the previous video. So again, if the number is between 1 and 50, that means that there's a 50% chance that it will happen. If it's between 1 and 20, that's 20% 20 chance that such number will be generated. So let's generate the number between 1 and 100 and return it from this uh, method. A simple return statement, we generate the number between 1 and 100, including 100, and return it as an integer. So next, we can create a method that will make the actual move. In 
order to make the move, we need to know how many spaces the runner actually moves, so we will pass that as an argument. So here's my method, and here's the spaces that we are going to be moving, that are being passed as an argument. Now each runner has different calculations that are used to calculate the number of spaces the runner can move, but the logic of the movement is the same for each runner. First thing we need is to keep track of the runner's position before the move is made. So we can assign the current position to the original position. And this is done so we can later display the runner's move, meaning to show from which position the runner actually moved. But also remember, as we move the runner across the racetrack, we need to clear the runner's symbol from the racetrack and place it to the new position. So I'm going to assign the current position to the original position. Next, we simply move the number of spaces that is being passed as the argument, simply by adding the number of spaces to our current position. But there's two conditions that we need to check. First, if the runner is moving back, we need to make sure that he doesn't move past the starting position, which is index zero, which is the row with the index zero on the racetrack. If that happens, we simply make the runner's position zero. So if the current position plus the spaces that we want to move is less than zero, then our current position will be zero. We'll simply put the runner back to the starting position. And if the runner passed the last row index, then he reached a finish line. But of course, there is nothing past the finish line so if the runner would end up past it, we can simply assign his current position to be the finish line. So we'll do an else if, and we'll check if the current position plus the spaces is greater than the track length, then our current position is the last index, which is the finish line, which is the track dot track length. So if we have 10 indexes, then our current position would be 10. And we have an else statement, which simply means that if runner's move results in the runner being between the starting line and the finish line, we can simply move the current position by the number of spaces. So we'll simply do current position plus equals spaces. Okay, next method we need for each runner, and which is the same for every runner, is to determine a winner. So after each round, each runner will run this method to see if he won. But here's the thing, we do not need a separate method for a turtles and a hare or any other runners. Remember, all of the runners will inherit from the runner class, meaning that every runner will be of type runner. So we can pass runner into the method as an argument, instead of passing instances of turtles and hare separately for their own is winner method. So we can have just one method and pass the runner type as an argument and it will work for every class that derives from the runner class. So I'm going to pass the runner type into this method. So now, when is the runner a winner? That's easy, when he is on the finish line. Remember from our previous method, when the runner ends up going past the finish line, we will assign him a finish line position. So we can check if the current position of the runner is a finish line which is the last row of the track, which is the index that corresponds with the track length. So we can do any statement and see if the runner dot current position equals the track length. And if that's the case, then the runner reached finish line and we can return true. And if that's not the case, we will return false because the runner obviously is not at the end of the, of the track. In other words, didn't pass the finish line yet. All right, and finally, we need to calculate how many spaces each runner needs to move based on the randomly generated number. Remember, the calculations are different for each runner, so each runner needs to calculate his own number of spaces to move. So we need to make this method abstract and override it in each individual class for each runner. So here's my calculate move. I, like I said, I made it abstract, so it has to be overridden in each class. And each class will have its own logic to calculate how many spaces the runner moves. So this is our runner class. 
Now, before we go, let's revisit the truck class for a second. Remember, in the previous video, we started to code our player position method that will display the runner symbol on the board. But we did not have the runner class ready yet. Now, we of course want to display the position for each of the runners, and, and so far we only have the abstract class for our runners. We don't have any concrete classes of the turtles or a hare, for example. However, that is all we need. All we need is the runner class to make this method work. In fact, we don't want to calculate the position for each runner using a different method for each one separately. Remember, all our runners will derive from the runner class, so we can use this as the argument for our method, just like we did in our runner class when we did the isWinner method. And this way, the method will be polymorphic because it will work for different classes of runners. So I'm going to pass the runner as an argument. So now each runner will pass itself into the method, meaning that we can now calculate position for each of the runners using the same logic. And the logic is very simple. The position of the runner is a cross point between the runner's current position, which we store in the current position property, and the lane that the runner occupies. So the current position reflects the runner's position in a row, and lane, of course, reflects the column. And we can use this as our indexes in the trucks array. So like I said, we take the current position of the runner and place the runner symbol at that cell. So the current position is for the row or for the line, and the lane is the column. And in that point or in that cell, we will place the runner symbol. So that should do it, but there's still one more thing we need to do here, and that is to delete the symbol from the runner's previous position. Runner now has a new position, so we don't want the previous position be visible anymore. And to do that, we will simply assign the value of null for the runner's original position, which is stored in the orig position property. And of course, the column is the lane index. So here, I'm taking the original position for the row and for the column, and I'm placing null to it because now the symbol for the runner will be placed in the new position after the move is made. All right, so our truck class is finished and we also have finished our runner class, which is our main class from which all the runners will inherit. In the next video, we will continue creating our derived classes. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.